Hello, this is Grant Kirkhope, and you're listening to XVGM Radio. Welcome to XVGM Radio, where the bits keep coming. I'm Justin. And I'm Mike. And this is episode 30, Perfect Dark, with Grant Kirkhope. Yes, we are super excited today because we are talking about one of my personal favorite games, and we're speaking with one of my personal favorite composers, Grant Kirkhope. Thank you so much for joining us on this absolutely blockbuster episode. (laughs) Seriously. Yes, blockbuster no less, that's what I say. Yes. (laughs) Absolutely. Total blockbuster. (laughs) We're going to be asking Grant a ton of questions about Perfect Dark, about his time with Rare, and the time even after Rare. Uh, It's pretty much going to be a Perfect Dark-centered episode. A little bit of straying. Yeah. (laughs) Very little, though. Yeah. Just to start off, do you want to talk about the uh, the tracks that we came in on? Absolutely. So the track that we came in on was main title, Enter the Dark. It's a two-part track. It's basically the Nintendo 64 logo uh, <laughs> for that first beginning part, and then the beginning cutscene of the game where you are introduced to the world of Joanna Dark mm-hmm. and the Carrington Institute, and you're just kind of learning a little bit about the plot as you land on your very first level. Right. So. Ba- basic introduction. Yes, exactly, exactly. Now, this entire soundtrack was not done just by Grant Kirkhope. It was Grant Kirkhope, David Clinic, and Graham Norgate. So we are going to talk a little bit about the other composers on this one as well. This game came out in 2000, and it was released exclusively for the Nintendo 64. Yeah, we are almost on 20 year. Uh, this is a game is almost 20 years. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I know, right? Wow. Makes, yeah, makes God, me, that's a long time, right? It <laughs> makes yeah. me feel old. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so, what do you think of that track? The the two tracks that we kind of came in on. Yeah. So the first track was like by Graham Norgate, right? So when Graham was still at the company, he left like halfway through Perfect Dark development, or maybe slightly before that. Hmm. He went to chop with the guy, the kind of the main Golden Eye guys, to form that company, Free Radical. Yes. And yeah. the went for, so most of Graham's music didn't make it into the game. A, a little bit did, but not very much. Mm-hmm. So that very first bit with the choir that happens on the logo, right? We had a, we had a sample library back then. I can't remember what it's called. It might be something like the Voices of the Apocalypse or some, one of these sample libraries that we had, and that was a sample with the voices. Hmm. Start, start a single note and split. So it's, it's an entire sample that Graham just took from the library and used in the game and oh, put wow. a gunshot on it. That's huh. really cool. That's neat. Yeah. I think I've got that somewhere actually. I've got that somewhere on my PC. But I can, that's that's where that came from. Huh. And then um, at that time, I was doing Banjo Tooie and Donkey Kong 64 and Perfect Dark at the same time. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so, we, so uh, because Graham left, I got given um, Perfect Dark and Robin Beanland got given uh, Jeff Force Gemini that Graham was doing because, doing, like, you know, to split the games between wow. us. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jeff Force yeah, Gemini so is happened. another one of my favorites. And, like, now <laughs> yeah. in my tiny little brain, it's just like the gears are moving. And I'm like, what would a Grant Kirkhope, the Jeff Force Gemini <laughs> soundtrack sound like? <laughs> well, I think I think Robin did a great job on Jeff Oh, absolutely! Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's so that's what happens. So the games get given to us. So <laughs> I was already doing Badger Two and DK Sixty Four, and they said, "Well, you know, can you do Perfect Dark?" I was like, "Oh Christ Almighty, I'm not so sure I can do it." So <laughs> I said that um, I said I can do the music, but I can't do the sound effects. So Martin Penny did the sound effects, and I did the, the music. Okay. And then just at that point in time, um, just after I started it, we hired David Clinic to be a musician at Rare. So I said to him, you know, you know, to get him broken in to work at the company, I said, David. 
he could do the the cutscenes. Okay. So oh. most of the cutscenes, and I think the multiplayer stuff is done by Dave Clinic, uh -huh. and I did most of the level tunes, or nearly all of them. There's a couple of pieces left in the game. I might be sure if it's a couple, but there's a little bit left in the game that Graham did. Mm -hmm. But um, it might have been rearranged by me or added to by me. So something like that. It's hard to remember such a long time ago. Right, right, um, right. But um, I, my, my gut sort of says that Graham's got a bit in the game. Dave Clinic's got the cutscenes and the multiplayer, and maybe some of the bits, and I just can't remember. But the right. third, that very first piece was by Graham, and the second piece you heard uh, was by Dave because it was the first cutscene. Right, right. Okay, very that cool. makes sense. Good to know. I just so fondly remember that, that introduction because I, I was hyped for this game before it came out, and I remember turning like buying the game and getting the expansion pack for it because oh, you needed yeah. the expansion pack in order to play like almost all of the game. <laughs> and I remember turning on the game and that that main title, that ominous those the, the choir is just so evil sounding. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, it, it, it really kind of uh, makes you think about what you're about to, what kind of game am I getting myself into, you yeah, know? Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, look, yeah, I think, but yeah, it's really, that kind of first quiet thing really set the scene. It was a great intro with the gunshot and the way the logo morphed into the PD logo. It was yes. like super cool. So yeah, I think it was a great, um, great start. Rare did a lot of that actually with the N64 mm. logo. They would always like morph it into either the Perfect Dark logo or like Conker's Bad Fur Day when Conker like slices through it with the chainsaw oh, yeah, yeah. You know, they, yeah. always, they always tried to do something really fun which which was it was it was a nice touch so that was part of rare's thing right we always tried to push it further than we could you know but in, in that in that kind of golden era of rare right i think we really felt like we were not on top of the world but we were all trying super hard to, to outdo each other right so <laughs> You know, we had that constant thing about trying to push the envelope all the time on those games. That's why I think they, it's a real, stand, a real standout time for Rare in that time. Absolutely. So what we're going to do is jump into our first track of the Perfect Dark extravaganza. We're going to be listening to Data Dine Central Extraction. And this one, again, was composed by Grant Kirkhope. And the rest of the soundtrack was also composed by David Clinic and Graham Norgate.
Welcome back. That was Data Dine Central Extraction off the Perfect Dark soundtrack released in 2000 on the Nintendo 64. The soundtrack was by Grant Kirkhope, David Clinic, and Graham Norgate. My favorite part about this particular song is I love the setup for the end. Oh, I, for the end, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of, like, all these, like, really faster portions of each song made it into the combat, like, deathmatch area separate. So you could hmm. create your own, like, soundtrack for what songs you wanted to hear. Like, that section of this song combined with, like, all the other, like, really fast-paced sections made, like, perfect deathmatch music. Like, you could set it up so that the soundtrack only played whatever tracks you specifically wanted. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So what I would do is I would take all the really, really kind of, like, amped up fast stuff and I would use that as the deathmatch music, like for every single time I played deathmatch. <laughs> and I've got like, uh, we were just playing before the episode started just to like, you know, kind of reminisce. And I've got like three days worth of, three days, <laughs> 10 hours play time? of yeah. playtime. <laughs> so I played this game a lot. You played it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have to say, my, my favorite part, you, you like the setup for the end. I like the, the, the setup in the beginning. I, I, I like the, the, the hits mm. and the drums. Um, yeah. I, I feel like you don't really hear drums that sound as clear mm -hmm. as, as, as those did on the N64. Just really punchy. Yeah. Like, like really, really just like, kind of crisp. Hard hitting. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that is, that is sort of quite surprising because like, the quality and the, and the music, uh, the actual sample quality is so poor that it's surprising that it, it sounds even halfway decent because we had to compress the sample so much and mm. get the sample rate down to tiny amounts to try and save memory. You know, that um, it's surprising it does sound so good. I can't believe it myself sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you've posted on the website uh, or on your own personal website, like uncompressed versions of the songs from the soundtrack. Like most famously, uh, I know you po posted up the credits hmm. theme. But right. What instruments and machines and tools or programs did you use to create this soundtrack? And what's the compression process involve when hmm. converting it to the N64? We all used Cubase, I think, back then, which is like a sequencing program. Okay. Yep. Um, but the, the way you would, the way you did it was you'd create your own little MIDI orchestra. So you find sounds you like from synthesizers or whatever sample libraries, and you you generally like you know when you when you get a sample library these days, they will say, say, let's say it's a French horn, they will sample every single note of the French horn, you know, long, short, in between trills, you name it, every single articulation possible, and then lay it out on the keyboard so you can play it. Mm -hmm. But back then we can only we can only sample one note. So wow. let's say we sample a, a middle C on a French horn. Yeah. And that would have to do for the entire thing. So obviously, it, yeah, as you take one note and lower it in pitch, it starts to go wah, 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 wah. Right. Yeah. And when you take it up in pitch, it starts to sound like Mickey Mouse. So you had a very tiny range that you could use it, the instrument sample in, but that inside they completely shit. Huh. Um, let's say the French horn sample, I'd take that and I'd, I'd, I'd sample it at, full, at 44 kilohertz, which is, which is like um, CD quality. Mm -hmm. And then I'd try and knock it down. So usually everything was knocked down to at least 16 kilohertz as well on the half CD quality. And it'd be mono, not stereo, so all mono. And so if I can get it further down than 16 kilohertz to 11 or even 8, we'd do it. And then we'd, then we'd stick it back in an, an editor and try and add some treble to it because it sounded so muddy, muddy and awful. <laughs> And then we'd stick it into the M64, and then we had our computers wired up so we could put it via MIDI. We could play the samples inside the M64 from our computers, which I think made a bit of a difference, which meant that we could, rather than writing a track at full quality and then trying to make it sound good in the M64, which it never did, mm -hmm. so it always just stand shit. We'd actually play the samples in the M64, so you'd find yourself using instruments that sounded good at, you know, at certain times in the track. Right, right. Rather than rather than shoehorning something in that would sound that you wanted to use that sounded shit, you'd use something that was would sound as good as it could be in that in that situation. That, that's why I think some of the rare music I think stands out from the period because we did it that way. We put, we we use what we had rather than what we didn't have. Well, huh. was that a kit that Nintendo gave you guys specifically because you were like a second party, or was it? No, no, not really. It was okay. available to anybody, but it was expensive. Uh -huh. So at the time, the N64 dev kit sat inside the silicon graphics computer. They were the kind of the high end machines of the day, super expensive, like twenty grand a pop. Wow. And <laughs> um, you know, so but all of us had one each. Uh, wow. well, right. Anybody on the N64, I mean, Verb was such a, a cash rich company in those days. Yeah, yeah. And so, so the N64, it's called, it's called the Ultra 64 when we back then before it got called the N64. Right. And the actual, the actual circuit board sat inside the indie computer. Hmm. Um, and so that's how, that's how we docked to it. And so we would run a cable out of our PCs into the indie. I think it was via MIDI, I'm sure it was. And then we could control the samples. So then we actually ended up playing the samples 
in the machine. So when we had the MIDI file sat on the computer and we saved it out and put it into the into the N64, that MIDI file would just play the samples in the N64. Oh. So it sounded exactly it sounded exactly like you had it on your computer. There's no question about how it might sound. It sounded exactly the same way you you composed for it. Pretty much so, like real time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you had so you just you went through and found a bunch of sounds that you liked, as many as you could that you could squeeze in there and you used those instruments throughout the game. That's why a lot of the samples get repurposed as sound effects and all over the place because we had to save memory so many, you know, so much that you might find a sample of a, of a clarinet was a great sound effect when it's pitched down really low or really high and you couldn't tell it was a clarinet that it would sound that way. And like and the same way sound effects could sound musical if you down pitch them or up pitch them depending on what. So that's how it worked. So we had to I think some people get confused about the compression on their consoles that they think that somehow we wrote the we write the tracks and they get compressed down to like an MP3 format. That isn't how it works. Oh okay. You know all the samples were stored individually on the N64 and the MIDI file played those samples. So like people say, I mean, I did write sort of six or seven tracks for GoldenEye that are uncompressed that you can find in the internet. They're on YouTube somewhere. Yeah. Um, people think that they, they were just compressed to work in the N64. They weren't. I wrote those tracks because I was waiting for an N64 dev kit. And so rather than sit twiddle my thumbs, ah. I wrote some tracks. So when the dev kit turned up, I didn't have to, I had to convert those tracks to work on the N64 and the got, quality got messed down. So none of the... the Perfect Dark soundtrack exists at high quality. Apart from that one credits tune that I redid, um, like nothing, nothing exists. You couldn't find that track anywhere that was full quality. It doesn't exist. Oh, I, I just, interesting. I, I just put, I just, yeah, I just put the sounds in 1064 and played them in the N64, and then rep- the MIDI file got generated, and then you save the MIDI file, compress it, stick it in the N64, and then that with the MIDI file in the N64 played the samples in the N64. The credits theme. So you're saying that that song was written during the gold. Goldeneye era, like when you were working on Goldeneye? No, no, no. I'm just saying that I decided to record that track. I did do oh. six or seven tracks for Goldeneye for quality. Right. Right? But, but Goldeneye was the first game, was the first game that I did. So by the time Perfect Doubt was happening, I didn't write anything for quality. I just did it. I just put the samples in the machine and played those. Right, right. But right. I did I did I did redo the credits theme at full quality. I can't remember I did it now. I might be in some kind of Japanese show or something. I remember I did record it again at, at full quality and you know, but, ah, I, okay. but okay. you he went yeah. back and redid that one. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah because that yeah. song specifically has like wailing guitar <laughs> and I mean yeah. it's like real guitar. Yeah, yeah. Like it's not yeah, uh, yeah, and, and it sounds like totally different. But then it's interesting because I actually really like the N sixty fourth synths that were used. Mm-hmm. And then when I heard like that uncompressed that that redone version of the credits theme, I thought to myself, well, maybe it's just because I'm so used to hearing the N sixty four version. But I actually uh, preferred the synths on that N sixty four version to the the other ones because they sounded a little bit more like tinny mm-hmm. whereas the i don't know maybe it's just that the n64 sounded a little bit heavier like like crunchier yeah yeah because because you get yeah cause you're, gonna, you're gonna lose all the top end right because you can't when you compress stuff down you lose top end you right. lose it all so you know so because like when you reduce, reduce a sample rate you lose all the high definition right right so right. And I understand what you're saying, because some of the samples in the N64, but I couldn't recreate outside the N64 right. to work the same way. Yeah, yeah. So that, that synth kind of goes wah, 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 that, right, that, that sounds like a filter being opened and closed. Like, that isn't what it is. It was, <laughs> there was tiny little samples that, so we had a big synth waveform that kind of went wow like that, right? Mm-hmm. And we cut it into, into tiny little bits literally like tiny, tiny, tiny segments of a bit of a bit of the bass note and then the next note and the next note and the next note al- along the line of the kind of waveform. Right. So you get the kind of what you get that wah, wah, bah, 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 oh, so okay. it's basically like a start-stop sort loop, of thing. Yeah, and then we'd loop those. Huh. And then you get, and then you could switch in between them to give the illusion of an actual filter up and then closer, but it never was that. It was actual physical little, tiny little clips from the original waveform cut up as small as we can get them wow. and then you'd, you'd, play, you'd play them in order to get the illusion of it going up a filter up and closing it's, you wouldn't believe the lens we used to go to <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> amazing that's insane <laughs> it's really crafty too <laughs> yeah <laughs> that track you just played yeah that was the first track that the first track that I composed for the game so when I started the game that was the first one that I did oh really oh, okay good okay. one to start the show with then. yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah that but also another story another story behind that love was when we went to the EP that year I think I was doing I think uh, maybe I think maybe two games came out that uh, that time maybe Perfect mm-hmm. Dark and maybe Banjo Tui or DK I forget right but yeah. I remember at the um, uh, the Nintendo press conference at theatre downtown in LA we got to go to that and I was sitting right at the front I bought this video camera and they had a live band as well playing some it was DK Kids they had a live band there okay but they had a whole dance routine worked out to that track 
Oh, wow. I was, just there, sit, yeah, I was just sitting there thinking, oh, they're going to show the game. And then um, all these dancers came out, like, doing secret agent moves. And the mirrors revolving. It was all it was to that track. I, was, I couldn't believe they picked my track to do it. I was like, oh, my God, you know, I've got it on video somewhere. Oh, that's um, cool. Is, yeah, that, so is that cool. on YouTube somewhere? No, I have it. I have the video oh, on, oh, my, it. on my. Yeah, I'm, it's not. I guess I could, I could should dig it out. I suppose we didn't put it on YouTube. I should put it on YouTube. But yeah, I've got that video. Yeah, yeah, whole, that'd be... I've got that, yeah. I've got the video of the whole press conference and they had, had a live band who played the Donkey Kong Donkey Kong 64 theme tune with a live band as well. It was really cool. That's really neat. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that on online. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I think, to yeah, see. I think that was in the day before they used to televise the conferences, right? But, oh, the, but the, 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 the press conference used to be like for press only and you yeah, know and right. developers, so yeah. no one would see it that wasn't the developer. Huh. These days, everyone everyone sees it. But I've got that video, so I should dig it out and do something with it. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be really awesome cool. to see. If you ever post that, let, definitely let us know. Let, we'll, we'll yeah, link it in, in this yeah. episode too. Absolutely. Yeah, I should, I should go look for it. Yeah, yeah. It's got to feel really good though to like, you know, that they're they're doing this thing. And it's like, oh, that's what, I made that song. That's my song. <laughs> this they're is using me. Yeah, this uh, is my jam. Yeah, it, it, sounded, it sounded pretty cool for the big PA system. It was like really rocking, you know. So yeah, and they were all they were all there's lots of girls in Joe Dark outfits and guys, yeah. you know, running around with mirrors and all. It was a bit bizarre, really. But that's cool. Uh, it was uh, it was cool. They used the the music. Yeah, I'd love Super to see that. Super cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. yeah, and this track plays. It's the third level of the fir- third part of the first, first level, level, basically. Yeah. So uh, you're invading this data dine central location, and the whole purpose is to have your main hero or heroine, Joanna Dark, invade to secure a character who is actually a laptop. Mm. Uh, oh, yeah, that's yeah. how futuristic yeah, that's right. this yeah. this, uh, this game was. Uh, his name was Doctor Carol, and so you were trying to get access to Dr. Carol, you end up running into uh, one of the main villains, uh, Cassandra DeVries. Right. Or DeVries. Yeah. You knock her out and you steal the key, you run downstairs and through a hellfire of bullets and everything and you end up uh, meeting Dr. Carol. So the whole point is to try to get Dr. Carol then extract Dr. Carol out of uh, the Data Dine headquarters. Data Dine, of course, is the bad guys yeah. of the entire adventure. So when you're hearing this song, all the lights go out and you've got Dr. Carol, you're trying to get out, you're trying to extract Dr. Carol out of the building here. And it's totally appropriate because it's got that whole spy vibe to it, but also just listening to this song while, especially when it really ramps up and gets going uh, while trying to escape is just, it's it's just there's nothing like it, you know, when when playing through this game. Yeah. So we're gonna Yeah, that, that helicopter turns up outside right, tries to shoot, doesn't it? That's really cool yes. as well. Oh yeah. 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 So we're gonna move into our next track, which is Carrington Villa Hostage One. And again, this is the perfect dark soundtrack released on the N sixty four in two thousand by Grant Kirkhope, David Clinic, and Graham Norgate.
Welcome back to XVGM Radio. That was Carrington Villa Hostage 1 off of the almost always amazing Perfect Dark soundtrack. I say almost always amazing because the parts that aren't amazing are even more amazing. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> see where I went with that? I do. I was curious where you were going with that. You were like, wait a minute. You just kind of, what, what, what just happened? <laughs> so I, oh man, those synth hits. Yes. Like those those stings, those damn, just like those on this soundtrack, as well as Goldeneye, just really stand out to me. And of course, those hard hitting drums, that thumping bass line that it's almost, it's not a slap bass, but it's like, it's close. I don't know what it is, but it sounds yeah, so chunky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I can't think where I got that from, actually. I think they, I got a funny feeling it might be called something like X Wire in from the JV Roland 1080 synth maybe I'm guessing I can't remember huh um but like with those orchestral hits right because it's a mono sample if you play it out of left and right at the same time it sounds like it's in the middle hmm. right because you hear the same sample at the same time so, you, so to get that gap I found that if I separated it by one tick which is a tiny amount of space it would sound like it was in stereo Ah. So I'd have the left one play and then right one play one tick after it, which is about that's a tiny amount of time, it's a nanosecond at a time. But that's all it needs to separate it out. And so you hear it in you hear it in stereo. So it makes it sound twice the size that it is. So that's why it's got that kind of epic quality to it, because I found that I could separate things by just that little tiny gap would give me enough to not to fill the human ear huh. into wow. thinking it was stereo. That's cool. That's amazing. I I never never would have occurred to me that like that's like that's where you get this big sound from. Like I, I was just assume sort of that they play from both at the same time. Right, right. Um, but like you said, that like yeah. that just it feels like it's from the middle, and then you get the stereo feel. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's huh. It's it's huh. In, it's always interesting to hear like the little tricks and things that composers do to try to like get the most out of this older yeah, hardware. Yeah, yeah. Especially on some of the older stuff. Like the yeah. I mean, the N sixty four isn't like. It's not obviously it's not as old as the SNES or the NES, right, but like right. any of that stuff. Like you, you hear the stuff and you, you, you think like this sounds really good, and then yeah. you hear you know oh this is actually how I got it to sound that way, and it's like that's that's not like what I would have thought at all. That's, no, that's really like really creative thinking. It's it's almost like trying to put a puzzle together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in a way. Yeah, I think we really tried to stretch the to stretch it at Rare. We always used to do that. Um, it was I think Rare got known ever since Donkey Kong Country with Dave Wise doing such a great job on that first game. I think Rare got known as a as a company that, would, that, that wrote great music. So I was kind of the last guy in really <laughs> until Dave Clinic started. So I was it was like because there was Dave there, Evelyn, Robin, and Graham. Right, and then they hired me. So I was kind of, you know, a bit down the line. So I had a lot to live up to, you know. Those guys did <laughs> such a great job. Right, right. Um, you know, yeah. So, I mean, um, you just discovered things as you went along. You, and, you know, I, I would have thought, you know, that orchestral sample, but, you know, a both speakers at the same time would sound like stereo, but it doesn't because it's an identical sample. It sounds like a straight down the middle. I was like, well, that sounds crap. Mm. So, and then I thought, well, if I delay it a little bit, maybe, and then that, you know, you, you get, you start to learn little, little tricks that make things sound better than they actually are, you know. And, you know, it's uh, the N64 did, didn't have a dedicated sound chip, right? So that was another reason. Yeah, everything right, had to right. go on the main CPU. So we had to fight the CPU time, you know, to try and get the bloody things to play in the first place. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So speaking of uh, like like how how these got put together and, and some sort of some of these um the, these challenges that you faced, I'm curious like what or which tracks uh, that ended up in the in this final game were the hardest for you to compose and like what what sort of made them so challenging? I don't think anything was challenging. I think because you know you, you you wrote music that you wanted to write, right? You know, mm-hmm. you to just get to get the dev team to to like it. I mean, nothing because we were using, we'd already created a little mini. I've already created a little mini orchestra. I knew that that wasn't going to change for the entire game, right? So, mm-hmm. if there's something that I wrote later that might require an extra sound, I'd have to say, kind of add another sample to the game. It's going to take another 56 kilobytes or something like right, that, just right. tiny, right? Yeah. You know, and they say, well, they think the command is that, you know. So it, it would be like that. So it, because you had like a finite palette. It's like you had a certain amount of colours to play with, and that was it. That's all you had. So you knew that you had to make that sound good, and that was it. Mm. You couldn't just keep adding and adding and adding stuff till it sounded great. It was like, well, I've got to make it sound with what I've got, you know. So I think sometimes when you get limited in that kind of thing, it, it makes you a bit more creative because you, you've got to squeeze more out of it, you know. I think these days you get like, you know, you put one finger on the keyboard, you've got a great huge swathe of sound that's amazing, mm-hmm. you know. You couldn't do that then. <laughs> it just right, happened, yeah. happened. You know, I mean, the synths existed back then, but you couldn't use it because it was just, you'd never get it in the memory, right? You'd use one sound and that'd be it for the entire game. There'd nothing else would fit in, you know? Right, So right. I think we had to work out ways to make things sound presentable. 
and cross your fingers and hope for the best. You know? <laughs> uh, that makes sense. So you were also the composer, as we said earlier, uh, to Goldeneye. Perfect Dark was considered a spiritual successor to Goldeneye, but when, right. when you were composing Perfect Dark, what elements did you want to bring back, if any, from Goldeneye, and uh, what new elements did you want to bring in as well to the soundtrack? Hmm. There are some songs that are in Goldeneye that are in Perfect Dark. I mean, I'm sure the strings are, I'm sure the drums are. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, there's tons, I'm sure the theremin, there's tons of stuff. They're in Banjo Kazooie too. Because <laughs> yeah. once you've got a lot of sounds that you liked, you, tend, you tended to use them because they were like A, economical in memory, and B, they sounded good. And, you know, so it, it was like you didn't want to break it or you sounded all right, you know. So some definite stuff bled through. Mm -hmm. But I kind of feel like, I tried to get a more of a sci-fi sound for Perfect Dark. It's and, you know, with that I, theremin you know, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like you wouldn't think, if you wouldn't get theremin would sound good in a game or something like that, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, but kind of it did fit. If you, rather than going, they kind of doing the ooh like the haunted house <laughs> thing, to use it as a straight instrument with no kind of bending in between notes, you know. So mm. that sound made, made it sound okay. Mm -hmm. You know, at the time, I guess. I was a big X Files fan, right? So I, I was thinking X Files, X Files. I was trying to think that was something that that, that had a, a good sci-fi sound to it. I thought. Mm -hmm. Also, like things like Blade Runner, you know, mm -hmm. all the time thinking about those kind of soundscapes. That when we couldn't create that kind of soundscape because it would involve fantastic synths that we didn't have access to, or we right. couldn't sample them them small enough. Yeah. But it was certainly in the back of my mind, you know. So I think that I tried to separate Perfect Dark from Goldeneye by making it more sci-fi sound. That at least in my head, it might not sound like that to anybody else, but it does. It does sound like that to me. You know, yeah. And, you know, and I super enjoyed doing Perfect Dark. It was different to everything else I'd ever done before, so it was cool to do it and get a bit of guitar in there. You know, a bit more guitar. <laughs> but, you know, it was cool. You know, so I think that um, he just tried to make it sound otherworldly. I think, and that's, uh, maybe that's what I tried to find. I tried to make it. It, it had moments, I think, of otherworldliness. I kind of felt. Yeah. No, I I can agree with that. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense too. Because when you think about Goldeneye, was I mean, James Bond is mostly like terrestrial things. I don't right. I don't think they've ever taken on aliens. But like, then you got Perfect Dark, right. which is like the spiritual successor to, to Goldeneye. My, but now all of a sudden you've got aliens coming in and the, the otherworldly aspect that you mentioned makes mm -hmm. perfect sense. Definitely with Goldeneye at least took that whole James Bond theme right. and pretty much interjected it throughout the entire, you know, the da na da na 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 oh, yeah. yeah. You know, that, that, was, yeah. that was spread out throughout the entire soundtrack <laughs> but with Perfect Dark you don't have a centralized like theme. You don't have a, a motif, yeah. if you will. So it's, I would say the closest you would get is probably the credits theme as far as that may be sprinkled through a little bit hmm. throughout the soundtrack a little bit, so. Yeah. All right, well, we are gonna move into our next track on this spectacular episode of Perfect Dark. This is Carrington Institute, and it's off of the Nintendo 64 title, which was released in 2000, and again, the soundtrack by Grant Kirkhope, David Clinic, and Graham Norgate. Thank you. 
thanks for joining us back on our perfect dark extravaganza this <laughs> track that you just heard was carrington institute and that was off of the nintendo 64 2000 released perfect dark yeah i really liked the way this one started off like really slow and mm-hmm. chill just like like a like a relaxing jam vibe yeah yeah uh, and then like, at one point i could i could feel the tempo pick up but i didn't really notice uh, until we were toward the end i was like whoa this this got a lot faster yeah yeah uh, it, was, it was very subtle and i, I like the way that the um the, like the speed sort of creeps up on you it's interesting because uh grant had mentioned earlier about the samples mm. sounding like almost like dirty or muddy kind of mm-hmm. there's a part in this song that i totally picked up on that mm. uh it's that part with the horns it, you could tell there's layers of horns oh yeah and it's just like it's going lower and lower and lower and you could hear that pitch lower like as it's going lower the effect the sample is sounding like more and more kind of gritty yeah yeah was i kind of spot on with that grant would you say yeah because like as the trump it was a trombone right as they get lower this because i sampled this, i probably sampled them a bit higher than that so when, mm-hmm. when it got to the low register it starts to get a bit muddy yeah nothing you do about that right add one trombone note that right. was it you had to cover the entire range of the trombone like yeah. you know, it would never be like that Wow. Um, so that's just one of those things, you know, that's where it goes, yeah. Oh, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> it's it's just nuts to think how this was all pieced together. This part in particular, this Carrington Institute part, I, I am trying to remember when this is played. I mean, obviously at the Carrington Institute. Um, <laughs> so in the game, when you start up the game, uh, it, the camera kind of pans around Joanna Dark as she's typing on a laptop. And then you, you kind of, yeah, very GoldenEye style, you enter into her brain from behind her, and then you're seeing oh. through her eyes, basically. Yeah, yeah. And so when the game starts off, it pulls up a menu, and you can you know pick from you know one player, cooperative, combat simulator, all that stuff. But if you exit out, you could actually exit out, and then you could walk around the entire building for the Carrington Institute. Oh. It's pretty neat, yeah, actually. Yeah. Like I don't think there's any game that since then that has done that or if there are I can't think of any but uh, it's like the, the Carrington Institute is sort of like a hub world yeah yeah, yeah 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 and like but like you're not really doing anything you're just kind of walking around and like seeing <laughs> random people you can go in I think you can even go into the training area hmm. but if I recall correctly there's a part later on in the game that this track plays because you are going back to the Carrington Institute and then there's like I think at that point that's when the aliens start invading oh. and so yeah you do you do definitely end up fighting in there I remember yeah yeah because I remember like the whole area getting like you know compromised and you got to yeah. kind, of, kind of try to escape that's why you're hearing that credits theme or at least the Carrington theme that I don't know if it was like the Carrington Institute theme like this was the first theme and then they when you created the the credits you were like oh I'll just take that little motif from the Carrington Institute and then throw that in was that the case with the credits or was it did you write the credits theme and then you were like oh we'll I'll use that in with the Carrington Institute song no I think I wrote the credits theme right at the end of the game probably so like that was the Carrington theme probably came first but okay. when I first got to Rare right I was first track music I tried that that theme had come from I think I'd written it before I was at Rare or maybe written it when I got there but mm-hmm. early on because like I really liked the um, the theme to Speed the movie Speed okay. how that was yeah. yeah. so that was my kind of I was trying to think about how that theme worked it's a great great theme and great work and, and I tried to use that in that kind of theme so I had a version of this that was a bit faster and less laid back than mm-hmm. it is right there Okay. that I'd written it rare thinking I just I, I was messing around with the gear trying to write something think, you know not, not thinking what it would be before and it wasn't until I did, did Perfect Dark that I thought oh, this theme would be, would be great with the game hmm. so I brought it into the game and I, I kind of feel like that the current thing would have come first and the credits thing would have come at the end yeah, yeah. that makes yeah. sense yeah. yeah what was your working relationship with David and Graham regarding the composition for Perfect Dark like for example what <laughs> What input did they have in the creation of the soundtrack, or how did you work with them on it? Well, Graham had left, right? He'd gone. So, um, obviously, me and Graham are still friends to this day, so I'd see him regularly at Curry's and stuff, and all that right. we do, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he'd left the company, so it was left to me to write the soundtrack. So, right. I don't think Graham had written a lot. I can't remember, but it wasn't much because mm-hmm. he was busy also on Jeff was Gemini as well. So I think he was busy doing that a bit more than he was doing Perfect Dark at the time. Yeah, and he was also doing sound design too. So he had a big, he had a big lot, lot on his plate that we all did. Mm-hmm. 
So, and then Dave Clinic, you know, I had to get onto speed, I had to teach him how to use equipment, how to, how to get something in 64. That's a bit of a learning curve, you know, it's, mm. not, it's not easy to just go pick it up straight away. Right. So, <laughs> my job to kind of police it all and to keep an eye on it all, that's Matt with me and keep an eye on Martin with the sound effects too. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so I guess it was it was my vision, really. Yeah, I don't know, I don't really have to talk like that. It makes it sound like I'm some kind of, you know, huge overseeing <laughs> right. wanker. But uh, I wasn't really that. It, it, it was just like, um, I just said to Dave, look, Dave, you know, you do, you do the cutscenes, do what you like. And that, I, 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 I don't. I don't I ever said to him change that because if Dave Dave's a great friend and writes great music yeah so um everything he did was great there was no issue in my mind of anything of that at all mm-hmm. I, would, I just thought more about the main level tunes that was my main focus mm-hmm. and some of the samples in the game were left behind from Graham mm-hmm. so um that long funny noise that goes in the background of that track of one of Graham's samples I can't remember what he called it now it was a weird name <laughs> I don't know where he got it from so yeah so, so I did keep some of his samples I, I did, um but I, get, I did keep some of the instruments I think maybe the drums right <laughs> it's hard to remember so yeah yeah but um <laughs> But um, yeah, so there was no kind of me being some kind of huge guiding light on it. It was just like I was the guy that was doing the game and Dave was getting up to speed as mm-hmm. I do the cutscenes and I, I kept some of Grey's music back. I don't think much because I don't I don't think I'd written that much. I, I, can't, I, mean, I just can't remember. Mm-hmm. Right, right. It, it sounds like, I mean, as, as far as working with David, uh, that you had like a lot of confidence in, in him to be able to like, to do what needs to be done and to make sure that it all fit and was cohesive. No, oh, yeah, like you know, at that point in time, after Graham left, Robin and me kind of took charge of the sort of Robin later became head of music at the company, mm-hmm. um, but we sort of took charge of the hiring things. Any guys that got hired at that point were usually interviewed by me and Robin, so we interviewed Dead Clinic hmm. and Steve Burke, um, and and, and we, we liked him, so we hired him. That, and you know, Dave's a great writer, mm-hmm. but also Dave later on in Rare he's also a great producer so when he after I said after we'd done Perfect Dark I said look you can, you can just do Perfect Dark Zero by yourself now you don't need me mm-hmm. so he did all Perfect Dark Zero and did a great job on that right, but right. he also got really into the production side in the studio because we you know the studio at Rare is a, a quite a posh studio mm-hmm. so and also he ended up producing all the music that I put into Diva Pinata so all the, all the romance dances all that stuff he produced it all mixed it all you could, Dave was great at the technical side too right. so Dave was a great advantage to the whole team that he could do the production side of it and mix stuff all, and also write great music on his own so it was a fantastic addition to the team oh that's so, great yeah so at that point in time as far as like the the staff graham had left and so you had uh you and david and then you had was david wise still there yeah so it's been dave wise robbie beanland me evelyn was still, evelyn there, was still there right david clinic i think we also had Ben Cullum. Okay. Ben Cullum is actually the brother of Jamie Cullum, who's a very famous jazz singer in the UK. Oh. Uh, that's his brother. Okay. Uh, so, and then Ben was there, and also a guy called Alistair Lindsay, who I think did help Robin out on Jet Force Gemini. Okay. We had quite a few people there, I mean, in my opinion, on side effects as well. Jamie Hughes, who's still there. Mm hmm. Uh, he was also he did a lot of Game Boy stuff back then, but I think he's and sound, I think it's a sound designer mainly. But he does write, he's a great a great composer too. Hmm. So yeah, it was a big with a, a lot of it, a lot of audio guys back then, and we slept. I mean, you know, we, everyone started leaving after that point. Right. Uh, but I think I was linked, I think I was next to leave after that. Okay. Um, but yeah, so uh, you had quite a decent amount of staff there doing music for stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, so let's get into our next track. Actually, this is Justin's pick. What do you got for us? Yeah, so we're gonna have uh, I think a lot to talk about after this one. We're going to listen to the Chicago Stealth track off of Perfect Dark, uh, and as we said before, released on the N64 in 2000 and composed by Grant Kirk Hope, as well as some of the other tracks were also done by David Clinic and Graham Norgate.
Welcome back. That was Chicago Stealth from our highlighted game today, Perfect Dark with Grant Kirkhope. So yes. tell <laughs> me uh, about this track, Grant. What what are your thoughts on this one? <laughs> so this is my favorite track of my own from the game. Wow. Um, I actually wrote it before, before I was at Rare. I was trying to get a job at Rare, and I wrote this, one of the, I wrote a ton of music in the year before I got a job at Rare, trying to get a job there. Huh. And um, I was a massive Miami Vice fan. So oh. um, I mean, that's a bit of an old 80s TV show. I don't know if you're too young to remember it. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. We're, we're children of the 80s, so. <laughs> All right. Well, I love that show, right? And it always had, like, really great moody music by Yana Hammer. Mm-hmm. Um, when, like, when, like, you know, Don Johnson was doing something moody or looking out to the ocean or something like that. Right. And so that first keyboard part as it started was my kind of Don Johnson-y um, <laughs> thing, you know. So I just really liked it. And also, it was also, it was set in that rainy kind of mm. level that just reminded me so much of Blade Runner. So yeah, absolutely. I was trying to get that Blade Runner feel too. And I had my best Lars Ulrich Metallica drum kick and snare sound. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Now I really want to take like video footage of Don Johnson from Miami Vice and just like slip <laughs> this track like in the background. And then push off and <laughs> it would, like the would fit perfect. Yeah, it would fit perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you said that you actually composed this before you started working at Rare? Yeah. Out of curiosity, because what we were talking about earlier with um, you know the way that you you ended up composing a lot of the stuff for this game through the, the N64 and all that, is there an alternate version, like a, a differently composed version of this that uh, like that, that's not through an N64, or did you just have this sort of composed musically um, and then you ended up putting it through the N64 when you, when you put the game together? Uh, I might add it somewhere, definitely in the MIDI file, but I've got the synth that I used to do it anymore. I sold it, no. so I don't know. I might have it on a cassette. I've, I've, I, seriously, I might have a cassette tape of it somewhere. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> so I guess that's possible. Um, I'd have to find it. I do think I know where it might be, but yeah, I would have a version of it that, of that you know, using the out of Proteus FX synthesizer huh. module. It, it was all done on that. Oh, wow. So an emu synthesizer. So I, w- I would definitely have that. Yeah, I'll have it somewhere, but I'd say it will be on a cassette. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> that yeah, no, ha- having it on a cassette, I think, is even is even cooler. Like yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's not it's not in a digital <laughs> format. The, the only the only copy is on this this one right cassette tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah That's super yeah, rare. Definitely. That's so cool. <laughs> Regarding the track, I absolutely love how it's got that like like ascending descending melody with those keys like yep. later on the like yeah like the arpeggios and stuff yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that that part in particular actually made, made me think of Blade Runner and like, absolutely it, it was funny because we mentioned it earlier when I was listening to that like I kind of had this Blade Runner esque theme in my in my mm-hmm. mind and then he said Blade Runner and I was like oh and like immediately my brain just like slapped a skin on I was like yeah, that's yeah. Blade Runner it's like oh that that's what those, those, those lights are <laughs> <laughs> there's good reason for that because yeah. this level the Chicago Stealth level this is after the Carrington Villa when you rescued Daniel Carrington from being held captive by Data Dine in his own like villa like his right, own right. like location and so uh, at this point you're infiltrating uh, this Chicago uh, office building I mm-hmm. guess you could say and you're, you're kind of going through um, it's raining it's pouring rain and uh, one really cool aspect of this game is that Joanna Dark changes outfits depending on what situation she's in kind of like Tomb Raider like Lara Croft did oh, yeah, yeah. so I think Lara Croft did it first but they definitely continued it here and I didn't play any of the uh, Tomb Raider games like back in the day I didn't <laughs> my first Tomb Raider was Legends yeah, in, like yeah. the 2006 like GameCube era so uh, this was the first time I ever saw like a character change into a different outfit like in the middle of the game and I thought it was so cool because you know in this level in particular she's got like a trench coat on uh, she's got her hair slicked up and you know she's infiltrating in through this building you know being like super sneaky there's a whole different bunch of things that you need to do in this level in order to gain access to the building Uh, you have to like set off a car alarm basically (laughs) with like all these like all the guns and stuff that all the techie gadgets that you would get in this game would uh, allow you to like remote access into like cars Mm -hmm. and then like you would smash a car into a a wall to distract all the guards you could sneak by it's it was really innovative all the really cool stuff that they were doing back then with this game i mean it was fairly similar to goldeneye but i think they just took it to the next Next level level. yeah yeah Mm, yeah definitely i think it was a a step up and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. you you know you you kind of you knew by that point i think they felt we knew what we were doing with that kind of that kind of scenario or that kind of game 
So, yeah, I do feel like Perfect Dark should step up. I know GoldenEye has got the huge name attached to it, and it was a great thing with the mm-hmm. multiplayer because it was one of the first games to do it. Yeah. But I felt like Perfect, Perfect Dark had a, best, had a good story, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely love the story, and it, it was captivating. It was really cool because uh, it was, like, one of the first times, at least on the N64, where you would hear, like, fully voice-acted characters. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of that, I've actually heard that uh, Nintendo originally wanted an American actress to fill the role of Joanna Dark, and that Rare wasn't happy with the people that they were screening uh, so they, or auditioning, so they ended up casting Evelyn Novakovic, who's better known by her maiden name as fellow Rare composer Evelyn Fisher. So Rare has a longtime history of working within when it came to voice actors. Do you recall hearing anything more about Nintendo being persistent about getting an American to voice Joanna, even after like Evelyn was picked, or did they just kind of roll over and say, "Yeah, you know that makes sense. Okay, you yeah, know, do that." I think Rare usually stuck to its guns, mm-hmm. I and mean, it wouldn't be told what to do by anybody really. I guess that's part of the reason I think Rare was good in those days. That mm-hmm. I like that kind of attitude where it's not focus group tested. It isn't. It just it just run past anybody. We want it to be this way, and that's the way it's going to be, and that's just the way it's going to be. And it's mm-hmm. hard luck, you know. I think Rare, certainly with Tim Stamper and, and Chris Stamper around the company. Mm-hmm. They were very focused and very adamant when they made decisions about stuff, and they were not going to change their minds, mm-hmm. and would not let Nintendo bend them anyway. You know, yeah. That's the way it was. <laughs> if, only so, if, if something was like offensive or something like that, they would maybe consider taking stuff out. Mm-hmm. Like the knife was, remu- was removed from Goldeneye because at the time there was a very awful killing or murder in Germany at the time, so we took the knife out. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the incident. It was quite a big incident. I don't know if it was a mass killing or something like that. A horrible Jeez. stabbing happened, and wow. we took the knife out for that reason. Um, well, like when Nintendo thought I was saying fuck you in Banjo Kazooie when the gravestone, the, the flower pot said that I did thank you, and they thought I was saying fuck you. I wasn't, of course. We changed that, but uh. you know, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. But yeah. um, usually, Rare would just say, This is the way it's going to be. If you don't like it, tough luck. Yeah. On that note, actually, Perfect Dark had a mode that was removed too. There was a specific camera. Oh, the face mapping. No, so you could take, you could take the Game Boy, the little Game Boy camera you know, on oh. the Game Boy. Yep. And you could photograph your face. Mm hmm. And you could get you could put it into the game it would map it onto a character so that's what you could do right huh. but, but we but we thought nintendo thought it would be a bad idea because it was open to abuse so you get people would map their friends on or what you know things like that so we right. kind of felt like it was not a great idea so it was taken out in the end but the it all worked but it was one of those things that we all that we thought <laughs> that was one of the best it's probably a mistake to do that i found the name <laughs> you're never gonna guess what it's called perfect head all right <laughs> all right, nice. uh, oh, multiple boy. levels of why that might have been removed. Yeah, that that it's that, not a, not a great name uh, for that. But uh, yeah, actually, that was right around the time of the Columbine. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, massacre, yeah, high school massacre. So it, it was around that time when they actually had the feature in the game and they got it working. Like they got yeah. apparently got it working, but just as Grant said, they they pulled it. I guess at the last minute. I remember reading about that feature in Nintendo Power yeah. and thinking, oh, that's really cool. But in my high school mindset, I would have, or rather oblivious mindset, because yeah. you would think high school would be like, oh, I'll take a picture of myself, you yeah. know, I'll take a picture of my junk and then, you know, <laughs> uh, make make me shoot myself in the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be so silly. But like, I, I never would have thought to do something like that with the Game Boy camera. I would have just thought, oh, this is cool. I get to shoot myself in the face. You know what I mean? I'll just take yeah. a picture of myself. Like, Yeah. Yeah, so it's a bit like the stuff on Swap Thing in Banjo Kazooie, where, you know, where, where we had that working where you could, you could you know, change the game and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But Nintendo again said, it's a great idea, but you're going to get kids are going to take the Banjo Kazooie cartridge out, ram in the Banjo Kazooie cartridge as fast as they can, and break the N64 and then blame us for it. You know, oh. that's, that's quite true. That, that would open them, up, open them up to kind of legal. And it's true enough. You know, you kind of said, well, you taught my kid. You could ram the cartridge back in the N64 super quick and now you've broken it. Right, you, right. You know, so th- there are going to be times that Nintendo were right about stuff like that. You sure. Know, and, that's one of those times. and uh throughout the game, hidden as well, there's tons of Easter eggs in this game. Oh, yeah. And one of the Easter eggs is there's a piece of cheese hidden in every level. And it was like an really? inside... Huh? Is it really? Yeah, there's huh. a piece of cheese hidden in every single level. I remember being a teenager and finding a random piece of cheese. And I was like... Is that is that a piece of cheese? I was so <laughs> confused. Rare did a bunch of videos on like all their games for the Rare replay that came out on the uh, Xbox One. Uh, so they did a video on Perfect Dark, actually a couple videos on Perfect Dark, and they did a bunch of information about the little Easter eggs. So I definitely recommend everyone checking that video out if you if you haven't 
seen it already. It's It's got a lot of really cool Easter eggs like that. It's funny. Be- oh my gosh. <laughs> because uh, the whole reason why this interview is taking place is because uh. I kind of promised Grant a very large wheel of cheese. Not sure, yeah. And uh, so, uh, Grant, you're gonna, you'll have to give us your address so we can send you a very large... So somehow we'll oh, like have to arrange... a cheese basket or something. Uh, yeah, our cheese basket or a very large wheel of, of cheese. You'll have to give us your, your favorite flavor. I completely forgot about that yeah. until, like, yeah. y- you looked at me and immediately I went, oh my god, that's, that's yeah. how the whole thing started. <laughs> yeah. Cheese comes full circle. I basically was like... Absolutely. I was like, how can I get Grant Kirkhope on our show? <laughs> And then I thought to myself, cheese bread. He must like cheese (laughs) or hard candies. I think I said hard candies as well. Oh oh my god! So maybe gummy bears. Cheese will do it. Yeah, cheese will do it. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so let's move into our next track. This is Airbase Espionage on Perfect Dark. This is the Nintendo 64 game released in 2000. Again, the soundtrack is by Grant Kirkhope, our wonderful guest of honor today, as well as Dave Clinic and Graham Norgate.
Thanks for joining us back on XVGM Radio. That track that we just heard was Airbase Espionage off of Perfect Dark, released on the N64 in 2000. The soundtrack was by David Clinic, Graham Norgate, and most importantly, our guest of honor today, Grant Kirkhope. Most importantly. Most importantly, <laughs> yes. So, Airbase Espionage, this if I recall, is an infiltration track as well. Well, most of these tracks are, but mm. at this point, you're trying to get into this airbase to secure, I think, the aliens who are called the Mayans. Mm. And I think you're trying to rescue or get Elvis. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. So I absolutely love the ending on this because it comes out of nowhere. It just hits you over the head. The whole track is just like very militant. You've got those mm. drums. That I was going to say, like, nice, I, I like the military style of great, the track. Great like snare rolls and everything. <laughs> and then you've got those like kind of like sweeping synths and everything. And then as the uh, track ends, you just get punched in the face with this like <laughs> totally like epic moment where you're running for your life. And uh, again, all those like really, really fast amped up tracks yeah. make, make for great deathmatch music so <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to writing these songs that's the thing about these tracks is you're uh, i'm assuming that you're writing these parts separately because uh, each track has like a beginning a middle and an end and so the beginning portion is like the beginning of the level the middle portion is like when things start getting a little bit more hot and heavy and then when you've got that really fast stuff that's when you know you're in the middle of a firefight so uh, when it came to composing these tracks, did you have those intentions in mind? Because these tracks aren't really separated out on the internet or even on the actual physical soundtrack to be named separate tracks. They're all like one level. So is that how they were all composed as uh, like one oh. one song? No, so like the slow part of the tune was always like, would be the part that would loop around as you wandered around. Mm -hmm. And we call them energy tunes. We would then we'd, we'd write a separate energy tune. So when the guards at the end of the level or the end of the thing that you've got, you've, you've, you've achieved your thing, mm -hmm. you're trying to escape or whatever it was, or more guards turn up and the energy tune would kick in. Mm -hmm. So it was just a, it's a separate, separate, whole separate MIDI file. It is, we just joined it together on the CD to give people the, you know, the let them hear what the energy level tune sounded like. Right. Um, right. You know when the you know as well. So rather than separate it out to make it because the, the CD was already already a double CD, it would have been even longer if we separated it all out and made right. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, I actually think that I wrote the level the energy pieces a week uh, uh, later. I feel like I did the levels first of all, and then I came back later and wrote the the energy tunes. You know, because I, I think at the start we weren't sure we we're going to have an energy energy tune on every level. Mm -hmm. There might just be some levels that, that need an energy, some kind of you know. Uh, you know exciting music at the end right then it turned out that they all required it so it, it basically yeah i think it was usually you got to the end of the task get to escape and you would kick into the higher the high, the high energy one you know right right uh it's really cool so we've been talking a lot about music here for you know obvious reasons and i'm curious as to what your musical background is we're well, going back to the very start i guess like i played recorder at four then i started playing trumpet at six and oh. did all the stuff through normal school in the uk mm -hmm. I was I was a very class I was a classically trained trumpet player. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I took up guitar, sort of self-taught about eleven or twelve, and taught myself to play guitar like mm -hmm. metal, you know, rock. That's my kind of thing that I like nice. to do. Right. <laughs> I went to normal school um, and then ended up going to the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester mm -hmm. uh, to do a proper music degree at eighteen. Oh wow! Uh, as a classically trained trumpet player, so I did four years there. Um, all the time playing metal bands on the on the side, <laughs> and then I left college in tw when I was 22, and sort of tried again to be a, to play metal bands. I did that as well. I also played in a, a couple of a band called Zoot and the Roots. Mm -hmm. There are some videos on the YouTube somewhere. Um, they were like a, <laughs> a, a soul funk band in the UK. We were like a proper working band. We played like three, four nights a week. Okay. <laughs> And I also played uh, trumpet in a band called Little Angels, who were quite a big rock band in the UK. They had a number one album there. Oh, wow. And they were a proper, uh, pretty big uh, UK rock band. They were friends of mine from years, years before. Uh, we supported like Bon Jovi and Van Halen and uh, ZZ Top. Oh, wow. Uh, That's cool. We did big tours. We did like gigantic stadium tours with like, you know, Brad Adams. We played with him, did Wembley Stadium. Um, wow. We did like a full European tour with Van Halen. We did a full Bon Jovi tour, which was, that was the. I'll sleep when I'm dead tour. So that was a gigantic stadium tour, outdoor oh, wow. tour of, of Europe, playing like Mannheim Stadium in Germany had like was ninety thousand people, you know. Wow. Um, so we did that. That was also with Billy Idol. So it was Bon Jovi, Billy Idol, and us. 
so I did a ton of that. So I was on and off unemployment benefit for most of the next 11 years. So I'd be like, I'd be playing some gigantic tour somewhere, then come home and back to playing pub rock, you know, for the next six months until I went on tour again. Mm -hmm. So I basically ended up being sort of um, on and off unemployment for quite a long time, like I say, 11 years, 22 to 33. And then my friend Robin Beanland, who played in local bands in the local area, like the Yorkshire area where I lived, we were friends. And he was a keyboard player, and he, you know, he played in some of the local bands that I played for. And then he said, you know, he went, he said, oh, by the way, I've got a job. I was like, what? I know when I knew you got jobs, we all just played in the band. <laughs> so yes, I've got a job at a place called Rare, right? And he said, you didn't go. I was like, I can't believe it. So about a year and a half went by when he was at Rare and he, like, we stayed in touch, of course. And he sort of said to me, you know, Greg, you've been on and off an employment benefit for like 11 years. Don't you think it's time you might have thought about getting a job at 33? <laughs> but I still lived at home with my mother. I was still at home with my mother. I'm like, most people by 33 have moved out or at least done something. I've done nothing, you know, mm. never had a job ever. I said, well, I suppose I could do, but I said, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Why don't you try doing what I'm doing, writing music for video games? I said, well, I, I, and I did play a lot of games at the time. Mm -hmm. So he read, I had about a thousand pounds left in my name. <laughs> and he said, uh, you know, why don't you buy a copy of Cubay? So this EV synth mo synthesizer module, a monitor, you know, some speakers and what have you. So I did that. Uh, and I started writing music that I thought would be appropriate for video games. So that was about 1994. So I spent a year sending cassette tapes to Rare over the course of that whole year. I sent five cassette tapes with different kinds of music on it, never got a reply. Hmm. And then out the blue, I got a letter saying, please come for an interview and can you please write these three pieces, which were a Batman style orchestral piece, a guitar based fighting piece and a Mario's sort of platform piece. Okay. And bring them with them to the interview. So I went to the interview. Dave Wise and Simon Farmer, who was the general manager, interviewed me on the Friday, it was. Oh, wow. And I got a letter on the Monday saying he got the job. Couldn't believe it. That's awesome. Nice. So That's I packed awesome. up my stuff, left my mother behind, and off went down to work at Rare. So, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> bizarre. I never had a job in my life before, you know, so it was pretty <laughs> peculiar that I'd ended up getting a job at that. And it was, you know, it, you know, it changed my entire life. You know, yeah, I was, I was yeah. just going to be a, I was just going to be a pub rocker for the rest of my life, probably making no money and be ended up a tramp at some point, you know. So um, <laughs> I owe everything to Rare, Robin, and all, all my guys down there. It changed my life completely. That's wow, really cool. That's, that's amazing. That's an awesome story. I'm curious, you mentioned you did a lot of metal stuff. What was your influence? So I guess Judas Priest was my main kind of thing that I liked. Nice. Uh, and, but like uh, later on, I got heavy, really heavy into Queen Drag. I really liked Queen Drag yeah. up until about. Mm. I didn't really like Empire, but I liked everything to that point. Hmm. So like Rage um, for Order and... Rage for Order, yeah, that's, that's my favorite album. For oh, that's Rage cool. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, all Rage that, for Order is a great one. Yeah, that kind of, the way that, you know, Ghost of Screaming and Digital, all that, all those tracks, fantastically. Like, I, I feel that album, you can't play it. You have to listen to all of it. You can't pick a track out. You have to listen to right. the beginning <laughs> to the end because it, it's got a real peak to it and it ends on that, you know, I remember track. It's just a fantastic record, that is. <laughs> right, right. No, that's really cool, though. The next track that I have picked out for us is the training track. This kind of comes anywhere in the game that you want to go into the training section. The game we're talking about, obviously, is Perfect Dark on the Nintendo 64 in 2000, composed by Grant Kirkhope. <laughs> Thank you. 
next BGM Radio, where the bits just keep coming. Welcome back to uh, XVGM Radio. That was the training track from Perfect Dark here, composed by Grant Kirkhope with extra compositions by David Klinick and Graham Norgate. And I really, I really like the sound of this one. I like the the synth that's in it because it's it's really I don't even know what the word is. Are you talking about that? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. really I, I like the I like the sound of that. Yeah. Now was that? Yeah, that was that was part. Yeah, that was part of the um, the cut up thing that sounded like a filter, but it wasn't really a filter. Right. Oh, cool. So you, you're constantly changing the note yeah. to a different sample to give that the impression it's a filter. Right. And I feel like I wrote this track quite late on because the training thing got added later. I feel because like, I think we did think we needed it and then we did. So I think I feel I wrote it later in the game than where it comes in the game. Oh, okay, okay. So when it comes to the Perfect Dark franchise, we had talked a little bit about this earlier, but David Clinic worked on the Perfect Dark Zero soundtrack, mm-hmm. which came out for the Xbox 360. And there was work being done on sequels that were never released, specifically two games, Perfect Dark Core and Perfect Dark Vengeance. These games were supposed to be a little bit more darker. Mm. They were supposed to be a follow-up to Perfect Dark instead of a prequel, which was Perfect Dark Zero. Uh, those were going to be on the Xbox, right? Uh, those were going to be on some oh, Microsoft okay. Xbox-related yeah, yeah. system because at that point Microsoft bought out oh, Rare. Rare, yeah, yeah. right, right. So were you ever being considered for a composer for these titles, or was it kind of past your time and that would David Clinic be brought on instead, or do you know anything about those? So I was done with Perfect Dark after the first game. Okay. Um, because I, I went on to do other stuff. I did Grab by the Ghoulies, Viva Pinata, Banji Nuts and Bolts, and we know, kind of passed along. Mm-hmm. Um, after Dave Clinic did Perfect Dark Zero, Chris Sieber, who designed Conquer, was making a new Perfect Dark game, which was really awesome. It was like it was set later. Janna Dark was quite messed up, scarred, etc. Mm-hmm. It was quite a darker game. And Robin Bean Lamb was doing the soundtrack for that, but, the, but Microsoft can be in the end. They didn't want to do it, uh-huh. which was a shame. I think it's Perfect Dark Zero didn't do very well, mm-hmm. and it wasn't received very well critically. They just decided to dump the franchise, which is a real shame. Yeah, and that it just got killed. I think Perfect Dark Zero killed it really, unfortunately. So that's what happened. So there yeah. was also that Velvet Dark, which was per- uh, Joanna Dark's sister. That's right. She was going to be a car- yeah. Oh. She was going to be coached in something. Yeah, they kind of um, like introduced that in the first game, or they started to, and then it never worked out. No, I mean Chris Sieber had a great game. You know that, was, and it was it was definitely along in production. It looked great, and it was mm-hmm. playing great, and all the rest of it. Robin had done some great music for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but Microsoft just decided to kind of to zero. Ironically, I think Paper Dark Zero was was Rare's biggest seller on the on the 360. Was it? The, I think well, I think it was the 360. Was it? Was it? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I feel like it, it was the biggest seller. It, it outsold Viva Pinata and all the rest of the games it put out at the time. Cool. But um, just got so critically slammed, they decided not to make any more. Well, um, it's just a shame too because uh, you know you had the Perfect Dark Core and Vengeance, which were the names of those games uh, that were supposed to be coming out. And you know Microsoft's supposed big takeaway was they didn't want to do any more sci-fi shooters uh, when they had Halo and uh, Gears of War. Oh, right, uh, right. but this game touches the series touches on something that's totally different yeah, from those two. I, I would say it has more in common with Halo. I mean, it's, it's a sci-fi shooter, but it's, I mean, it's more of a sci-fi stealth shooter, which... Right. Yeah, I, I, I feel like the, the decision to can it was nothing to do with the sci-fi shooter. It was to do with the fact that this, it got critically slammed and no one wanted, no one wanted yeah, it. That's what they thought. Really? Huh. That's what, yeah, that, that was the reason they can do it. I don't, I don't think... I don't think they might have said some of the reasons, but that wasn't it. That was the reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of a follow-up question. Now, there's another company that is kind of created with uh, a bunch of the you know your fellow rare contributors called Platonic Games and they made uh, Ukulele which I know you also contributed music mm-hmm. to working on the soundtrack for that as well as uh, David Wise was working on that one as well but I think you did the majority of that soundtrack right with the Ukulele yeah so would you say that hypothetically if Platonic was like hey we want to do like a perfect dark spiritual successor <laughs> which would be really funny because it would be like, oh, Goldeneye, well, yeah. you know, started <laughs> this all off. And, yeah, it's a spiritual successor to a spiritual successor. <laughs> have they ever approached you about anything like that, or no? Like I've I've worked on their new game, which is not out yet, and right. it, it isn't that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can always dream. No, I mean, no, I'd love to do. I'd love to do another Perfect Dark game. I really enjoyed writing that soundtrack. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed it a lot, and I, you know, um, yeah, I'd love to do it. Yeah. You know, I keep hearing rumors that Microsoft are thinking about it, but. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Is that something do you think that they would continue working with people in house or do you think that they would bring you bring you back into to rare to work on something like that? 
Well, I don't, Rare wouldn't do it. Rare are, are, are too busy working on Sea of Thieves. They've got, they've got no bandwidth for anymore. That mm. game's so big, the entire company works on that. Oh, Gone wow. are the days when Rare, when Rare work on multiple games. Right. They work on one game, and that's it. And that's it now. Wow. They, they do the same. If Microsoft, if Microsoft did choose to do perfect, perfect Dark again, they'd bring in another company. Like when they got... Um, is it Helix to do uh, Killer Instinct oh, again? Oh, Double or, Helix. Yeah, yeah, they got yeah. them to do Killer yeah. Instinct, they, right. They, they, they'd, they'd find another developer or they'd hire a bunch of developers and put them somewhere in America or, and say, all right, make another Perfect Dark. So I doubt that I doubt Rare really would have anything to do with it. They might, they might have some kind of say-so over it, but I wouldn't think they get involved in it in, in any kind of hands-on way. Right, uh, right. Interesting. And they might ask me to do it, but I, I would suspect they'd just have to ask another composer. Right. I'd try. Yeah. But I suspect that, that you, know, it, or, you know, when it, when it gets to the point where if they hire a dev team to do it, the dev team will be the people that will be choosing who works in the game, the composer. The guys that like the music from Perfect Dark, they might ask me, they might ask me, they might not, I don't know. Right, right, right. That's, okay. how, that's, how, that's how it works. That makes sense, yeah. Okay. So let's jump into our next track. What do you say? Yeah. All right, cool. So this next song that we're going to be listening to is Area 51 Infiltration, again off the Perfect Dark soundtrack from the N64, released in 2000 by Grant Kirkhope, David Clinic, and Graham Norgate. Welcome back to our episode and our spotlight on Perfect Dark, the N64 released game, which came out in the year 2000. That track that we just heard was Area 51 Infiltration, and it was by Grant Kirkhope. 
So I love, love, love this track, <laughs> and I especially love that dark piano. That's the only way yeah. I can ever describe it. Right in the beginning. Like, da, 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 da. like it's like a hammer with those keys. And even early on, they kind of give you a preview in the beginning when you've got those like strings. Strings, yeah. And then you've got that that da 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 da. It's like slower. But then when the song picks up after those like horn arrangements, and you've got that da 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 da, da it almost works like a double bass, yeah, almost yeah. with the uh, <laughs> with the drumming. It, it's fantastic. Yeah, I thought the first part of that track was my total X Files thing in my head anyway, because it was like you know trying to find the alien, and, you know, you right? Yeah. the bass, all that kind of stuff, you know. So, and I never used piano very much because it was a hard sample to get to sound good. That was my X Files thing. I really wanted to try and get that for that first part of this, the, the first part of the tune, and then like you know, like I say speed it up for the energy part of the end. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny listening to those tracks because I haven't listened to Perfect Dark for, for a long time. You know, I don't listen to it very often. And, I, I you know, I really like the music that, the music that I wrote. I like it a lot, you know. Yeah. Um, I guess I would say that because I wrote it. But, um, <laughs> you, know, you know, sometimes I hear things and think, why don't I, why don't I use that chord tunes anymore? Why don't I use that melody anymore? Or something like it anymore? Because I, I like a lot of it. I, um, no, I, like that. I do like that track. It's a good track, that one. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, as you said, this is when you are infiltrating Area 51, and I think you are, at this point, with Elvis the alien. And yeah, kind of like this... are, yeah, yeah. I remember, that. I, can, I can see it in my head, I just can't quite remember what you do. Yeah, yeah, and, the, and you're going through these, like, really, like, dark areas, trying to get to Area 51, trying to break in, basically, uh, and I think you're doing it to steal Elvis's ship. If I recall, oh, yeah, that, yeah, that sounds like yeah, that rings a bell. <laughs> yeah, cause yeah. The, the whole point is you're trying to get Elvis back into space, back into his yeah, yeah. Mayan. The, that's the race of aliens known as the Mayans, and then the evil race of aliens is known as the Skedar. So you're trying yeah. to go against them, and they're more like lizard esque, whereas the other aliens, the Mayans, are more like I guess stereotypical, you know, aliens that you would see, you know, uh, big heads and you know weirdly shaped bodies and everything. Yeah, I think we thought the Skeedar were a bit like, well, for me, they're a bit like the aliens in um, Independence Day. Yeah. A bit yeah. more, a bit that kind of look to it, I think. I yeah. don't know if that was at the time, I can't remember the date now, but uh, I kind of feel a, a bit like that. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that came out in like 95, 96-ish, so yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I, I yep. could probably go from there, yeah, but I feel like they were, that's the kind of look they had. Mm-hmm. So we're focused on Perfect Dark this episode, uh, although we have broken out a couple times for to, to mention like uh, Gold Knight, Banjo Kazooie, Banjo right. Two, and stuff like that. Um, and so with everything that we we talked about, you've composed for some big name classics as well as some recent like indie Kickstarter breakouts like Ukulele. From your perspective, what game was the most fun for you to compose for? Like, what, what did you have the most fun on, and like what what actually made it fun? That's a hard one, right? Because I've, I've been lucky in my career that I've worked on lots of games that have all turned out great and I've worked well on them. So. It's always hard to pick one. Hmm. And like, you know, Doom Banter Kazoo was great because that was the first game that I did by myself. I did all, all the sound effects, all the music. Right. Um, you know, so that was cool to do that. I liked doing Viva Pinata because that's the first time I got to use live orchestra. Hmm. Um, I loved doing Kingdoms of Amalur Reckonings. That's a, a big RPG, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings type thing. That was cool to do that with the, with the live orchestra again. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, doing Mario Rabbids last three years, really. That was spectacular. For me to think, to get to work with Mario, for God's sake, you know, as a... <laughs> If you told me that back in 95 that I'd get to work with the Mario, for God's sake, I would never have believed it. <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, to try and do that thing where Koji Kondo is obviously a fantastic composer who's written all of Mario's music forever and is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And for me to get to kind of try to follow in his footsteps, which is impossible because he's so brilliant and I'm just not that good. Like, you know, my God, that was a fantastic experience. And working with a team that Ubisoft and Milan and Paris were a great team to work with. And doing Mario Rabbids was, was spectacular for me like to get as I say to work with Mario was who would have believed it it's incredible you know yeah absolutely that's really cool yeah and you actually I, if I recall it didn't you win like a BAFTA award for that game the game won the children's award BAFTA yeah, yeah. I actually got nominated for a BAFTA for the score to Diva Pinata oh, oh wow. that's really cool well congratulations on the win that's awesome yeah thank you very much no no it was, I mean Mario Rabbids has been an absolute delight to do I've got, I get, I'm great with the guys with a good laugh and it's been a fantastic thing Nintendo has been great as well it's been brilliant absolutely I gotta say it's been almost 20 years since this game was released we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of the <laughs> original Perfect Dark next year do you have any regrets regarding the soundtrack or the game in general and if so what are they no in a word <laughs> like I, I get asked that quite a lot right I've I, I, I never go back and change anything about any game that I've done I just think it, it was best I could do at the time mm -hmm. and I'm not I'm not a great 
I'm not a great polisher, so if, if it didn't go right, I should probably leave it and do something else. <laughs> like, I just, I don't really go back and polish stuff very much. It kind of comes out the way it is. Right, right. It's just the way I compose music. No, I'm happy with Perfect Dark in its entirety. I mean, you know, all, all the games I've worked on, I'm happy with. Nothing, nothing will change about any of them. Very That's cool. good to hear, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, we are going to hear a track called Deep Sea Nullify Threat. And uh, as we have said a few times in this episode, it is from Perfect Dark on the N64 in 2000, composed by Grant Kirk Hope.
Thank you for listening. That was Deep Sea Nullify Threat from the Perfect Dark Game on the N64, <laughs> released in 2000, composed by Grant Kirkhope, and that was another like chill, slow song that ramps right the heck up. Mm-hmm. I like this one for a number of things. One of the things that I was thinking of earlier is sort of that like almost vocal, like choral, like oh, almost reminded me of uh, like the, the Halo theme. Obviously, this came out way before Halo. Oh, uh, not way before. I mean, Halo was Xbox, which was two thousand one. After oh, is it really? a year? Yeah. Wow. Halo okay. One came out in two thousand one. This game came out the year before. Holy moly! I That's... know, right? Well, I mean, clearly they ripped uh, they ripped off Perfect Dark. Yeah. <laughs> but now there, there's that, and then there's just like there's something there's a quality to the to the sound in this track that mm. just kind of screams water level. Okay. Okay. I guess I could kind of see that, and it makes sense because it's you know, you know deep, deep sea. Deep sea. <laughs> yeah. So I gotta ask though the those chorus effects that are that are kind of prevalent throughout this. After listening to them, uh, that part the the vo- vocal effect it sounded like Tarzan. Was that a sample? Yeah, so, no, well, that, that was one of the samples that Graham Norgett left behind when he left. <laughs> okay. So, and also this track actually is part me, part Graham. So the first part is Graham wrote it and I liked it, so I kept it. Mm-hmm. And then it's, it gets to me a bit later on. So I think when the melody starts, like, duh, 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 right, that's, yeah. when I, that's when it starts to be me, I think. I, th- I think maybe the roundabout's there. Okay. So that the whole intro part was kind of Graham's thing. That sample does sound like Tarzan. No, I, don't, I really don't know what it is. I don't ask Graham where he got it from. And it had a funny name on the sample list, and I can't think what I've got that list to look at the name of it. I can't remember what it is now, but yeah, that's one of his. I used that in other parts of the soundtrack too, because I like this, the funny sound it made. But I don't know what it is. It's some kind of vocal map. It could well be Tarzan. I don't know. I'll ask it. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a warped version of Tarzan, like with an echo filter on it or something like that. Yeah. Um, kind of like stretched out and like slowed down a little bit. It's, it's yeah, pretty no, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, I don't know where you go for. I'll have to ask him and let you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you take individual inspiration from something that some kind of information that's being given to you about the level that it's going to be in like when Chris or Tim Stamper or whoever was working on a level where they like okay this is going to be a level it's going to be underwater was that kind of what was done here with Perfect Dark? Yeah I think you know games mostly go that way it's movies the same or TV's all the same you know mm-hmm. you'll get given any one of a number of ideas about how it's going to be you'll see some artwork or you'll see a bit of video you'll hear someone talk about it or mm-hmm. you'll get a kind of file that tells you what the feeling and then it's left to the composer to close their eyes and imagine how it might sound you know mm-hmm. and I do think the you know any composer worth the salt is a bit pre-programmed like most human beings are you know human beings are pre-programmed to hear certain sounds associated with certain images mm-hmm. it's just the way it works you know um, i think it's probably like dates right back to the first movie composer or tv can whatever it was back then uh, saw his first cowboy movie and this how it should sound like this right and then, right. now we also every cowboy movie sounds the same you know i think that you know you just expect to hear certain sounds you know i think that someone says to me it's a frozen ice forest i'll be thinking about pizzicato strings and glockenspiels and celeste and spiky <laughs> things to go with the icy forest you know or right. if it's a nice warm forest maybe i'll think about you know warm bassoons and clarinets and string mm-hmm. you know so i think you you do start thinking about things in your head before you even write it mm-hmm. you know so Absolutely. i think that to more complicate it i guess on the n64 day you had a finite set of samples you had to, that you had to use and that was it mm-hmm. so you had to try and make them sound like anything that could be presented to you you know so it's, it's that storytelling thing. You shut your eyes and think, what does this sound like? Right, you know? right. Now, when it came to at your office in Rare, did you guys have individual offices or did you have like one big giant like jam session like with like a bunch of instruments out where you could just kind of jam out and, you know, kind of work with different machines? Or how, how did that work when it came to Rare's environment? So at the original place, Manor Farmhouse in Twycross, it was an old Manor Farmhouse building that Tim and Chris had bought and slowly renovated. Mm-hmm. And it had lots of outbuildings, like out, out stables and the, uh, called the barns. Mm-hmm. And so they gradually converted barns into development spaces. So like they were all separate buildings and they were all key coded. You, you, could, you could only get into your own building. You couldn't get to any of the, any, any of the barns that other teams were in. So you kept it very separate. Oh. So we all didn't know whatever each other were working on, really. It was, it was, trying, it was trying to encourage a bit of friendly competition within the company. Oh. <laughs> and, and so you had, we, had key, we had keys that were coded. You could, you could only get into your bit. So a bit, a bit like that. And then after that, when Nintendo bought half the company, or like just under half the company, like 49%, hmm. we had a custom building built a mile down the road, which is this gigantic complex that Rare's now in. In the old Tricross, there was an old 
like there was a, a kind of music block, but I wasn't in there because there wasn't enough space. I was in this other room called the Chicken Shed around the corner. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't get to be in the music block in, in, in the uh, original rare. And then when we moved down the road, there was also a custom built music block with a studio at one end of it and like all rooms built. But I wasn't in there either because at the time, Greg Mayles liked me to be in with the team. So I was in with the banjo team hmm. at the new, that's called, I think it's Manor Park, oh. which is just, it's just a mile down the road from Old Rare. But I did move into the music block eventually, but I was in with the banjo team for, for most of the time that was at Rare, oh. at the new beer. That's really cool. Yeah. Neat. All right. So we're rounding the bend. Just a couple more tracks to go. We are going to listen to Pelagic 2 Exploration from Perfect Dark. Came out on the N64 in 2000, composed by Grant Kirkhope. Welcome back from that fantastic track that was Pelagic 2, Exploration, from our 
highlighted game of Perfect Dark on the N64 in 2000. And I just can't stop listening to this track. <laughs> <laughs> it is a really good song. It is. I, I really yeah. I really like the me- the, the the melody piece. Like, yeah. And then like as as it gets a little bit later, I'm not sure if it actually speeds up, but it feels like it does. The, the entire like it does. the entire piece just like gets way more intense yeah. as, uh, as as you get further into it. Um, but that that melody like I can see that melody in in like a lot in like a lot of different scenarios and I mean outside of just like the the song in which, in which it's in like mm-hmm. I can see the melody sort of being repurposed and being like a bright happy melody and then also being used with the way that it was using just this dark intense track yeah this is at least that synth yeah uh, that that lead melody it's definitely one of the more brighter cheerier kind of sounding melodies but I really love that heartbeat bass doop <laughs> doop 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 I think that's part of what makes the track feel a little bit dark. Like yeah. It, 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 there's this like looming like heartbeat that's just like some, something's going to happen. Yeah. So when it came to creating these types of sounds, again, we've been talking about you working with Cubase and everything. What was it like on this particular track? What were you trying to go for with the sound and the style with that heartbeat bass line kind of uh, in the background with those chorus effects? How did that all come together? You know... Looking back on it, I was because I suppose it was the '90s, right? Or well, 2000. But I wrote it in like probably '98, '97, '98, somewhere around there. Right. You know, and I mean, that was still that time where, you know, in in movie soundtracks, you were getting synths combined with orchestra stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was just trying desperately to try and make it sound good with what instruments I had. So, you get some violins and stuff chucked in with like synths and normal drum beats. You know, it's that I was just trying to. Like, I didn't know a lot about it. I hadn't done a lot of that. So mm-hmm. it was me just sort of, you know, clutching at straws. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know? It really does hoping have, like, a movie vibe. Yeah, hoping it, that it would sound good, you know. So yeah. um, that's why I think I enjoyed the soundtrack so much, writing it. And I still, as I say, I've been listening to it now. It's like, I like it because I, I, I hadn't done anything like that before. It was a real complete learning experience for me. Yeah. I'm just glad it worked out so well. <laughs> Were there any kind of things that you took from the Perfect Dark soundtrack that you brought into other games, like, for example, Banjo-Kazooie? Or I know those are two very, very different <laughs> games, but was there anything that you took from this soundtrack as a learning experience that you kind of brought into other projects? Um, I mean, I did, obviously, later I did a game called Yaiba Ninja Gaiden Z, which is not a great game. Uh, <laughs> probably the least a game that I'm least proud of but I quite like the soundtrack mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I also did a game a couple of years ago called Drop Zone which I haven't done an awful lot of synth stuff mm-hmm. synth perfect art really because people keep hiring me to write orchestra music right, um, right so it seems to be a thing that people like me to do most of all but I also included synths in the two civilization soundtracks that I did the Beyond Earth soundtracks yeah Beyond Earth um, and Beyond Earth Rising yeah, Tide yeah. yeah yeah and so I think that you know it's I like working with synths it's good fun but I still get asked to do it an awful lot mm-hmm. you know it, it's cool to listen to Perfect Dark and think oh yeah you know I did something back then <laughs> you know yeah. Uh, but, so yeah I think you carry everything you've ever done forward with you to the next thing whatever that happens to be yeah and it, I think I think you just the certain chord sequences that I, that I listen to in Perfect Dark now that I still use today Oh, okay. I think I still use that code sequence for stuff that I do. It's just, you know, you find stuff that you like and you use it all the time. We're going to ask a couple silly questions here. So there's a ton of wacky guns in Perfect Dark. There's like the laptop gun. Uh, there's an X-ray sniper rifle, which is like <laughs> alien weaponry uh, from the Mayans. There's a, a ridiculous gun that loads like it, it's it's the coolest thing. It loads oh, from yeah. the side. It's like an alien pod. It's really weird. It, it like when when you load it, it it, it bulges and stuff. Right, yeah, right, yeah. right, right, right. It's it's quite disturbing. So if if you could create your own weapon to put into Perfect Dark, what what would it do or what would it look like? Mm, God, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be something like one of the Garden, Garden of the Galaxies things that Rocket uses. Because Rocket uses some really cool guns in oh, Garden of the Galaxies. Oh yeah. Like, okay. Okay. Something like yeah, something like that. Because I think he's, he uses really his guns are always great. So I think something like that would be great to get into Perfect Dark. Something that Rocket uses. Yeah, that makes sense. Fair enough. That'd be pretty yeah. cool. And of course, you know, uh, tie-in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, rockets from space. Yep. And you know, uh, the whole Mayan, <laughs> Mayan weaponry. Thing. So it could be like a Mayan weapon. The that space gun. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Very, very cool. All right, let's wrap up with our second to last track. We're going to go out on an outro, but we're going to play Skedar Ruins 
Battle Shrine, which is our second to last track on this Perfect Dark Extravaganza. The game was released in 2000 on the Nintendo 64. It also came out on the Xbox 360 and uh, Xbox One as part of Rare Replay, but it was redone for the Xbox uh, 360, which maybe we'll ask a few questions about that. It was composed by Grant Kirkhope, David Klinick, and Graham Norgate for this soundtrack.
Thanks for joining us back on XVGM Radio and our spotlight with Perfect Dark, the Nintendo 64 released game that was released in 2000. That was almost 20 years ago. Hard to believe that that much time has passed. Like I said before, I was in high school when this game dropped. And I just remember being completely infatuated with it. I remember reading all the articles in Nintendo Power and being stoked to play (laughs) it. Uh, There wasn't a lot of mature rated content on the N64. There was a little bit here and there. uh, The Turok games, the Quake games, uh, you know, a couple games here and there. But nothing from Rare had ever come out as a mature rated game at that point. Conquer came out the year later on the N64. But this was like, I think the first mature rated game that came out on the N64. And so it was cool because I was like at that point in my life where, uh, you know, I was looking for those more like mature experiences with those dark sci-fi themes and horror elements and things like that. Um, But I was so obsessed, just to talk a little bit uh, before we get into the music or whatever, this is one of my favorite games on the N64 and it just goes to show when you've got such a stellar soundtrack kind of backing it, it's really cool to have like that awesome soundtrack experience mixed in with a phenomenal game that Rare created. Oh yeah. The advertising for this game too uh, was really hip and Grant kind of talked a little bit about what they had done in that E3 thing with the dancers with Perfect Dark which I'm super interested (laughs) in seeing uh, because that's like a an inside look in E3, which we didn't really get too much of back then. Oh, yeah, it's not no. like th- these days where, like, you know, there's yeah. conferences left and right uh, that's open to the public pretty much. But uh, the way that they marketed this, they hired a model to dress up as uh, Joy in the Dark and basically plastered it all over TV and all over, like, newsprint advertisements and everything. And I actually got the cardboard standee and I had it in my room like my you know growing up or whatever and I don't know what happened to that thing I I moved out of my dad's house and I lost it and like I'm kicking myself (laughs) nowadays because I used to have this thing and I I just can't find it anymore it just doesn't exist on the internet and I'm sure it's sitting in somebody else's basement somewhere but it's it's stuff like that that really kind of brings you back to that era so you know, with that little story that I just gave in mind, what was your mindset back in the day when this game was being worked on? What were you thinking about when it came to the development of this game, the composition of this game? What were your overall like kind of feelings about that? And I was just really stressed because I was doing Banjo Tooie and Donkey Kong 64 on this at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I don't feel like I had much time to think about anything. I think I just used to. I'd do a perfect dark piece and a DK piece and a Tui piece and back to perfect dark then Tui then DK and round and round and round and round wow. until I finished. It was like that. Oh. And it was, you know, I didn't really expect to have that workload put on me. Right. Um, right. Uh, you know, because it, you know, it was Graham left out the blue really, so we didn't, you know, we, we didn't tell anybody he was leaving. Right. Uh, and then it was like, oh my god, how are we going to do that? And they'd, they'd already said to me, can you do DK64 at the same time as Banjo Tui? Because Evelyn was going to transverse to doing sound effects only, not do music anymore. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, because George Andres, who was a assistant designer on Banjo Kazooie, went to be lead designer on DK64, mm. so we were good friends and all that, you know. So it just all came at once, really. So it's a bit shocking to have to, to be like that. And also, we moved buildings. That was that was right at the time that we moved from Manor Farmhouse in, in Twycross to Manor Park, a mile down the road in in Atherston, which is just the next town over. Right. Um, right. So it was all a bit of a muchness, really. Like those those couple of years, I can't remember how long it took, really, but it was pretty stressful getting it all done. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, it was, I love to do it. It was great fun, but it was bloody stressful. Yeah, I can imagine. And plus, uh, it, when it comes to the styles of those games, those are three very different games. So I would imagine that the composition style that you were used to, you were writing, you know, okay, I'm, you're really like flexing your composition muscles. Cause you're like, okay, now I got to go for a more like whimsical track on like DK64. <laughs> now I got to go to Banjo Tooie, which is, you know, kind of along the same line. But yeah. if you're bouncing back and forth between Banjo Tooie and Perfect Dark, I, I would imagine that that's, uh, that's probably pretty stressful uh, in, in that aspect as well. Yeah, and also keeping DK separate from Banjo was because they were both platform games, right? That was a hard one. So in my mind, I tried to make DK a bit darker because I felt DK games were a bit darker. Mm -hmm. And Banjo Banjo, Banjo was kind of more oddball, goofy. Yeah. You know, like quirky. Yeah. So I tried to, and for me, that that was the hard part, trying to keep Banjo and DK separate. And I, I don't know if I managed it, but I tried. Um, I yeah, so. I would say you did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I mean, regarding the instrumentation on the, each of those games too, is so different than Perfect Dark. Because as we've said throughout this episode.
episode. You've got yeah. those. The, you've got the theremin to really kind of enunciate that sci-fi feel. You've got those that heartbeat bass line. You've got the the thick strings, those dark pianos. You know, when all of this kind of comes together on the Perfect Dark soundtrack, it really stands out and it really sounds so much different than anything else that Rare was putting out back then. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. Definitely different. Yeah. Yeah, and, he, and even regarding like um, like the, all, the composition of all three, it was darker and, and more sci-fi. But then trying to keep like banjo and DK separate, I feel like DK was fairly whimsical, but with like there, there was a very st- strong like jungle mm. vibe to it. Like yeah. the, the, the music, the music fit very well with what Donkey Kong was right. and, and what it was doing. And then you've got banjo, uh, and it was just like it, it was whimsical. It was, I, I want to say it was like almost like fantasy whimsical. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like they, they're definitely three distinct things. The fact that you're working on three totally distinct type of uh, soundtracks and keeping those tracks like in line with those games, that blows my mind. Yeah, that was it was hard. That was, <laughs> you know, I can't looking back. I can't believe we did it now, but like you just you just did. That was the way it was, right? You know, mm-hmm. that was the days of rare that we all did as much as we could. You know, so it was tricky, but you know, it came out right in the end. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll say question for you kind of in in the the world of composition that you've been doing as well as any of our listeners that might be interested in in doing music composition um i'm curious if you could go back in time to when you first started doing video game composition for rare is there any advice you would give yourself or to anybody starting out in the vgm composition industry i don't know if i give myself any advice but i'd probably <laughs> say to people wanting to start now you know you, you know make sure you listen to all kinds of music it's no good just being good at one thing like we used to get a lot of cds from guys trying to get jobs at rare who did, who did like dance music or edm stuff mm-hmm. they would sound fantastic but that's what they could do and that was used to say that's no good to us we need to do have people that can write anything yeah yeah so like when i got so when i came to do viva pinata the little animals did romance dances and the artist said that there was there was 65 animals right and said, look we think it'd be really funny if every animal had a different style of music to do the romance <laughs> dance so i'd end up writing heavy metal for one ballroom dancing for the next reggae for the next beatles hippie for the next you know so you get that you get have to write 65 different kinds of music which is you know wow. quite challenging yeah. you know mm-hmm. and you have to be able to do that you have to be able to analyze a track get the gist of it and then then write your own track you know yeah. so i think being a media composer like i am and that's anything mobile phones to movies mm-hmm. you have to be able to be adaptable and be and be able to write a huge variety of music well mm-hmm. so do that i'd yeah. say as a young composer learn to do you know, take the, you know, pick a piece of music that you don't like. Pick like if you don't like reggae, pick a reggae track and then try and recreate it. Hmm. But you know, work out the skeleton, work out what the chord changes are, where it goes, and then take the music out, and put your own music in. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's a great advice. way to learn yeah. how to do stuff. That's it really, really works advice. that way. You get the skeleton, you understand what's going on, you fill it full of your own music, mm-hmm. and then see how it works. You know, that's a great lesson to do. So I'd say that's what I, that's what I recommend really. That makes sense. Yeah. If you had the opportunity to work on another Perfect Dark game. I know I keep asking this, but who would be, you know, out of any composer out there, you know, forever and always, uh, past composers for video game music or or future composers or whatever, people that are currently in the industry, is there anybody that you would specifically, like, choose that you would go, yeah, I want this person to co-compose this soundtrack with me? I'm not great at co comp I've only done it once. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, never, I've never actually co composed with anybody apart from Danny Baranowski, who did Super Meat Boy and um, Biden of Isaac and those games. Yeah. And Danny and me are great friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, Jimmy Hinson is another a, a good friend of mine, Big Giant Circles. Um, I'd probably get one of those two or both of them to do it. I think cool. they write great electronic music. Yeah, yeah. Um, something like that would be cool, yeah. That'd be really cool. Nice. Final question. <laughs> Silly question. What is Joanna Dark's beverage of choice? <laughs> it would definitely be a cocktail because I've got I've got a cocktail glass of perfect dark on the side of it. Oh, that's cool. Huh. So I'd say something like I feel like a vodka martini would be what you drink. Okay, Fair I can see that. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, it has been a blast talking to you on this Perfect Dark extravaganza, as I'm calling it. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Where can we find you on the web? Uh, so I guess my best places are Twitter, so I'm at Grant Kirkup, and I guess Instagram, which is Grant Kirkup Composer. Mm-hmm. They're my two ones that I use, uh, use the most. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've got a website, of course, grantkirkup.com, but that, those are my best places to find me. Okay, awesome. Very cool. Cool, cool. Well, we, we look forward it. to yeah. hearing your future works, so very mysterious, and that's it's going to be exciting. Very, very yeah. cool. Let's uh, hope so. The very last thing that we like to do on these episodes before we introduce our outro track, which we are going to be playing the credits theme from 
Perfect Dark, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that one briefly or get your thoughts on that. But the very last thing we like to do is pick our favorite track. So we already know yours, Grant. It's uh, the <laughs> Chicago, Chicago Stealth, Stealth yep. song. Yeah, Justin, <laughs> where are we going with uh, your favorite pick here? I feel like I'm torn between Airbase Espionage and Area 51 Infiltration for a number of different reasons. Okay. But I will make a snap decision and say airbase espionage. Okay, so I'm going to go with Area 51 infiltration. I, I absolutely love those dark pianos, just hammering in with the yeah. with the, kind of mixed in or intermingled with those uh, drums. They really are fantastic. And second place would go to Data Dine Central Extraction, mm. and then of course you know the credits, yep. which we're going to be playing next. So we'd like to take a moment to thank our Patreon patrons without whom this show's continued improvement would be impossible. They are Alex Messenger, Scott McElhone, Cam Worma, Chris Murray, Kung Fu Carlito of the Heroes 3 podcast, Jordan and Anson Davis, Chris Myers, Peter Panda, Brad Austin, and The Autistic Gamer 89. If you would like to become a patron, you can sign up at patreon.com slash xvgmradio. There you can see the different tiers as well. Just $1 gets you a thank you and access to our monthly live shows. You can visit our website, xvgmradio.com, where you can listen to all the episodes and learn more about your hosts, as well as any of our guests or composers that we've had on the show. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can always email us at xvgmradio at gmail.com. And if you'd like what you've heard, please consider giving us a rating on iTunes and a review. You can also join our Facebook group and chat with other VGM lovers at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash XVGM radio, where we talk about everything from current game news to sharing awesome VGM tracks or just talking about the podcast itself. And you can find us on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle for both of those sites is at XVGM radio. If you don't have any other social media or just want to try something unique, check us out on our Discord group chat. Links will be in the show notes. So, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the credits before we uh, we finish up on the episode? I just thought of it from the a cool rock track that I felt at the time. I get a bit of guitar playing on it, so I had to work out how to get the guitar parts in memory and all that stuff, you know, to fit. Um, so yeah, I really like writing the credits scene. I kind of felt that was my little bit of metal at the end. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. Yeah, you're able to sneak in a little Queen's like little Operation Mindcrime there. <laughs> yeah, I'll get a little bit in there somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, again, we want to thank you so much for joining us on this episode, Grant. We This really wouldn't have been possible without you stepping up and, and agreeing to this interview. <laughs> so thank you so much. And uh, we will have to uh, mail out that cheese ASAP. <laughs> yeah. No, no, thanks for asking me. It's been great. It's been great fun. Thanks. Absolutely. No problem. All right. Well, this is Mike and Justin signing off for XVGM Radio. Enjoy the credits music from Perfect Dark.
Good night, Miss Dark.